Thank you for joining me on Synthesis Workshop. Today's Total Synthesis episode is a special mini-lecture on the two-phase synthetic approach to taxanes developed by the Baring Group. This talk will cover several total syntheses that were completed over an extended period, and we'll have the chance to see how this strategy has developed during that time. Probably the most well-known member of the taxane family is the iconic anti-cancer drug Taxol, or Paclitaxel, which was originally isolated from the Pacific yew tree. Nowadays, plant cell fermentation, or PCF, has become the method of choice for accessing large quantities of this target. The idea of the so-called two-phase synthetic approach is that taxol and molecules like it could be accessed through a biomimetic oxidase phase, which we can imagine as a sequence of chemical transformations containing a number of selective carbon-oxygen bond formations. The starting material for this oxidase phase could be one of a few different cyclic precursors with few or no oxygens present, including this molecule taxidiene. These intermediates could be accessed through a separate cyclase phase, which in turn can be imagined as a sequence of chemical transformations focused on carbon-carbon bond formation and the construction of the desired ring system. Together, the cyclase phase and the oxidase phase comprise the two-phase approach, which takes inspiration from the way that terpene natural products are synthesized in nature. One distinct advantage of this type of approach is that we can easily imagine how once we've reached a number of intermediates through the proposed cyclase phase, they may be carried on in different directions to access diverse natural and unnatural products, in this case, taxanes. For example, taxiununine D, d cinnamoyl taxanine E, and taxobacadin 3 could all be seen as products of distinct, though potentially related, oxidase phase sequences. Thinking more about this biomimetic two-phase approach, we can visualize a generic pathway leading from simplified building blocks to cyclic intermediates through an initial cyclase phase, followed by an oxidase phase that would provide fully elaborated natural products. In a foundational proof of concept synthesis, the Baron group showed that starting from methylvinyl ketone and isovaloraldehyde, they could develop a cyclase phase that would lead to dihydrogenol. That intermediate could then be carried on to complete a number of challenging targets, including eudesmin tetraol, by employing distinct oxidase phase sequences. Applying that synthetic logic to taxanes, the Baron group wanted to ultimately show that using a different series of simple building blocks, shown on the left, a relatively unfunctionalized cyclic intermediate could be synthesized and would provide access to a wide range of taxane targets, including taxol. The first step in bringing this plan to fruition then became clear, as it would be necessary to establish a route to the cyclic intermediate. In a NatureCam paper from 2012, the group established a route to the key cyclic intermediates. Starting from a tetrasubstituted alkene, they treated with bromoform and potassium terp-butoxide, followed by dimethylanilin, which resulted in the formation of a brominated diene. This reaction can be understood as an initial cyclopropanation to form a dibromocyclopropane, followed by an elimination reaction that occurs upon treatment with dimethylanilin and heat. Fragmentation through the electron flow shown would then lead to the formation of the product. The bromodiene could then be utilized in a 1,6 addition using the electrophile shown, where a nucleophilic attack occurred at the carbon marked in blue. That electrophile, as a side note, was accessed by a Grignard addition of vinyl magnesium bromide to a protected 1,3 diketone, which could then be treated with silica to provide the desired dienone. Following their 1,6 addition, they found that it was possible to carry out a 1,4 addition using trimethyl aluminum and copper bromide, followed by treatment with TMSCL to generate the enol silane. With that, they were able to reach the desired product in racemic form. In order to get the product in an anti-enriched form, they carried out an asymmetric conjugate addition using a biphenol-derived phosphoramidite ligand previously reported by the Alex Akis group for this purpose. With the enantio-enriched enol silane in hand, the authors used gadolinium triflate in combination with acrolein as an electrophile to carry out an aldol addition, after which treatment with Jones reagent yielded the enone product shown as an inseparable mixture of diastereomers. Subsequently, treatment with ethereal BF3 allowed an intramolecular diels alder reaction to proceed to give the two products shown. The product on the right ended up being the starting point for the two-phase synthesis of taxol, as we'll see later. For now, let's see how the authors of this paper derivatized that product in order to reach a few other valuable intermediates. Using KHMDS and bistrifloanilin, they converted the ketone on the right into an enol triflate, which they engaged immediately in a Nagishi coupling with dimethyl zinc in order to form the tri-substituted alkane present in this target, which is an intermediate that's become known as taxidienone. Taxidienone could then be further derivatized by first performing a lithium aluminum hydride reduction, which led to the secondary alcohol with the stereochemistry shown. Then, acetylation with potassium hydride and acetyl chloride led to the acetate, which could be treated with sodium in order to cleave the acetate group, providing taxidiene. Importantly, this entire sequence could be performed on at least gram scale, opening up the possibility of applying this route to the two-phase approach of diverse taxane products. As a first step towards accessing complex taxane targets using the two-phase approach, 
the Baron group started to look at ways to apply the intermediates that they'd reached with the cyclase phase sequence developed in their 2012 Nature Chem paper. For an initial target, they selected taxiunanine D, which is a target that would require selective oxidations at three sites, using taxidiene as a starting point. The authors started by installing the oxygen on the rightmost ring, which they achieved using palladium acetate and benzoquinone, which is an approach pioneered by Akermark and Bachval. In this reaction, it was found that inclusion of anisole resulted in improved yields, which was described as a serendipitous discovery resulting initially from the use of 1,3,5-trimethoxybenzene as an internal standard for a time course in a MARS study. The authors reasoned that the presence of anisole inhibited palladium black formation, which may suggest it aids in the oxidation of palladium-0 to palladium-2 under the conditions of the reaction. In this next step, the authors employed a unique chromium-5 reagent in conjunction with manganese-4 oxide in order to obtain the products shown. In the desired product, the oxygen was successfully installed in the position that it needs to be for taxiunanine D. Using more traditional chromium-6 oxidants, other byproducts including the epoxide or ring open diketone shown were formed. This oxidation has been proposed to proceed through initial formation of an allyl radical on the ring on the left, followed by formation of two possible chromium-4 bound alcohols, one of which leads to the formation of the desired product, with the other leading to the byproduct shown. It's also been proposed that this reaction may proceed through an alternative cationic pathway. In either case, it's been shown that this chromium-5 reagent does not lead to babor dobbin type allylic transposition in the way that chromium-6 reagents can in related systems. To install the final oxygen required for the completion of taxi uninine D, the authors treated with inbromosuccinamide and benzoyl peroxide to affect an allylic bromination, followed by a silver-mediated substitution reaction using a silanol nucleophile. Now, to finish the synthesis, dibel was used to reduce the ketone to an alcohol, which could be converted to the acetate with acetic anhydride. And finally, using IBX and DMSO, it was possible to simultaneously remove the TES group and oxidize the newly generated free alcohol up to the ketone, completing the synthesis of taxiunanine D. So, having demonstrated that it's possible to develop a cyclase phase to a tricyclic intermediate, which could be used to access taxiunanine D by going through taxidiene, the Baron group started to look at even more challenging targets. They thought that if they could develop a different oxidase phase reaction sequence, it might be possible to reach d oil taxinine E and taxibacadin 3 the latter bearing an additional acetyl group compared to the former. In addition to a further carbon-oxygen bond that would need to be installed, this time at C9, pursuing these targets would also require setting the stereochemistry at C2, C9, and C10. With the eventual aim of applying the two-phase strategy to taxol, these two new targets looked like a good intermediate step on the way to completing the group's long-term goal. In 2016, the group published the total synthesis of these targets in Angavant with the route starting from taxidienone. They started with a bavol blanc reduction using sodium and isopropanol, which gave a diastereomeric mixture of secondary alcohols, favoring the product on the left. This is in contrast to what the authors had previously observed in their 2012 Nature Chem paper when taxidienone was treated with lithium aluminum hydride, which had favored the diastereomer on the right. We can envision this reaction proceeding through an initial one electron reduction of the carbonyl to generate an oxyanion adjacent to a carbon centered radical, which can undergo a further protonation of the oxyanion and one electron reduction to lead to a carbanion, which then leads to the product upon a second protonation step. Then, the authors found that with a vanadium catalyzed epoxidation, followed by treatment with sodium hydroxide and DMSO at 140 degrees, they could successfully install the desired carbon oxygen bond at C5. This is in contrast to how they installed that motif in the taxiunanine D route, where they had used palladium acetate and benzoquinone. In the current case, however, the authors found that the presence of the secondary alcohol was leading to an undesired side reaction when the previous conditions were employed. Next, they were able to acetylate both secondary alcohols in good yield. At this point, they wanted to use the same chromium-5 oxidation that they had previously used to install the carbon-oxygen bond on the leftmost cyclohexane. In this case, they found that formation of the desired product was accompanied by formation of an undesired allylic alcohol byproduct. Then, once again taking advantage of the knowledge gained during the taxiunanine D synthesis, the authors treated their enone intermediate with inbromosuccinamide and benzoyl peroxide, followed by silver triflate and a silanol nucleophile. Unlike their earlier oxidation with palladium acetate, this oxidation strategy translated fairly well from the taxiunanine D route to the present system. The authors continued by using Burgess reagent to dehydrate the tertiary alcohol, and subsequent treatment with dibel resulted in reduction of the ketone at C13 to the corresponding secondary alcohol with the desired stereochemistry. Additionally, both acetate groups were removed in this process, resulting in a product bearing three unprotected alcohols. 
all of which were protected in the next step when sodium HMDS and mom chloride were used. Then once again, IBX and DMSO could be used to convert the TMS-protected alcohol at C10 into a ketone. That ketone proved a useful handle for installing the remaining carbon-oxygen bond at C9. To do that, the authors found that they could generate an enolate and use Vidae's reagent to generate an alcohol at C9. Subsequent treatment with copper acetate then led to the 1,2-dione product. Now, treatment with a relatively uncommon lithium aluminum hydride reductant resulted in a net reduction at C10. Here we're noting that it is a net reduction at C10, as it turns out that the initial site of reduction is actually at C9. However, a subsequent isomerization leads to the product shown, with an alcohol at C10 and a ketone at C9. Then finally, treatment with sodium amalgam reduced the ketone to provide a trans 1,2 diol motif at C9 and C10. With that, the authors had successfully developed a reaction sequence leading from taxidienone to the intermediate in the middle, using selective oxidations to strategically form all of the carbon-oxygen bonds they would need with the desired stereochemistry to complete the synthesis of decinamoyl taxanine E and taxobacanin 3. To finish these targets, they treated their intermediate with acetylation conditions to convert the C9 and C10 hydroxyl groups into acetates. And finally, subjection to carbon tetrabromide and isopropanol resulted in removal of the mom groups, after which another acetylation resulted in the completion of decinamoyl taxanine E. A further acetylation using copper triflate converted the C5 alcohol into a fifth acetate group and completed the synthesis of taxobacidin 3 as well. So, zooming out once more, at this point the bearing group had established a strategy for accessing a cyclized intermediate starting from simple precursors and shown that it could be carried on through distinct reaction sequences utilizing selective oxidations to reach taxiunanine D via taxidiene or decinamoyl taxidiene E and taxobacidin 3 via taxidienone. The next aim became the development of an oxidase phase that would allow them to reach taxol with this type of strategy, hopefully building in many ways on what had been learned in the previous syntheses. In their two-phase approach to taxol, the bearing group started from this diketone that we saw earlier as a precursor to taxidienone and taxidiene. Here they began with a C13 oxidation right out of the door using the chromium-5 reagent that we saw in the last two syntheses. Now, copper-2 bromide could be used to install a bromine at C5. The product of that reaction could be studied by X-ray crystallography to unambiguously confirm its identity, and we can see in that structure how the bromine has been installed on the bottom face of the eastern cyclohexanone. Now a C10 oxidation was accomplished using the same strategy as before, with an initial allylic bromination followed by a silver triflate mediated substitution with a silanol nucleophile. Then elimination with lithium bromide and lithium carbonate resulted in the formation of an enone from the bromocyclohexanone. We'll see in a few slides why the installation of that alkene was very strategic. For now, the authors treated with methyl magnesium bromide to carry out a Grignard addition at C4, followed by Dibal to carry out a reduction at C13, followed by a lithium aluminum deuteride reduction at C2. A sequence that took advantage of the relative order of reactivity of the three ketones present in the substrate. The product of that reaction could then be treated with sodium HMDS and TBS chloride to protect the secondary alcohol at C13. Then, in a key step, Treatment with DMDO resulted in carbon-oxygen bond formation at C1, along with the generation of an epoxide from the dye-substituted alkene on the right side of the molecule, giving the desired product in 49% yield. This was accompanied by the formation of an undesired byproduct with a ketone at C2. However, it was found that this byproduct could be reduced with samarium diiodide and methanol D4 to provide an intermediate which, upon treatment with DMDO, could be converted into additional desired product. Crucially, it was found that if the C2 alcohol did not have the stereochemistry shown, or if the deuterium was not incorporated, or if C4 was not substituted as shown, the desired CH oxidation process at C1 became very inefficient or did not take place at all. Here, a lay Griffith oxidation could be used to convert the secondary alcohol at C2 back to the ketone. Subsequently, it could be reduced using a bevel block reduction in order to form the C2 alcohol with the desired stereochemistry after which it could be tied up with a tertiary alcohol to form a cyclic carbonate. That bevel block reduction reminds us of the outcome that the authors found when they did the same transformation on taxidienone and were able to observe the same stereochemical outcome. Moving on, the authors treated their intermediate with tetrabutyl ammonium iodide and ethereal BF3, which resulted in a regioselective epoxide opening with the iodide nucleophile. 2-fluoropyridine was subsequently used to deactivate the residual BF3 before proceeding to protect the secondary alcohol with TMS and midazole. DMDO was used to oxidize the iodine and trigger a syn elimination. A subsequent epoxidation on the alkene could then occur to deliver the epoxide product shown, bearing a key carbon-oxygen bond at C7. 
Then, to take advantage of the newly formed epoxide to generate a secondary alcohol at C7, the authors treated it with the Nugent Reagent Bobby reagent, formed from the action of titanosine dichloride and zinc, which resulted in reductive cleavage of the epoxide. The resulting secondary alcohol was then protected with bomb chloride before proceeding. Now the Burgess reagent could be used to affect the dehydration of the free tertiary alcohol, giving the desired alkene product with a free allylic alcohol and 32% yield. In addition, 5% of a byproduct still containing a TMS group on the allylic alcohol was obtained, as well as a byproduct with a ketone at C5. The former could be converted into the desired product using HF pyridine. Now, to form the oxetane ring of the target, methane sulfonyl chloride was used to activate the allylic alcohol, after which a dihydroxylation with osmium tetroxide resulted in the product shown. Heating the intermediate with Unix base and toluene resulted in oxetane ring closure, after which IBX and DMSO could be used in a familiar way to deprotect and oxidize C10 to the ketone. Now, the authors used a C9 oxidation procedure that differs from the one we saw before using Bidet's reagent, but is instead inspired by the approach of Holton. Using these conditions, the alcohol at C9 was successfully installed with the stereochemistry shown. This procedure also resulted in the cleavage of the cyclic carbonate. Then potassium terpetoxide and THF could be used to trigger the type of isomerization we saw before at C9 and C10, after which the cyclic carbonate could be reformed and the remaining free alcohols could be acetylated. TASF was then utilized to remove the TBS protecting group, and phenylithium was used to open the cyclic carbonate, giving a benzoate group at C2. A byproduct with a deprotected secondary alcohol at C13, but the cyclic carbonate still intact, could be treated with phenylithium to generate more of the desired product, which is a bomb protected analog of Bacotin 3. And finally, the C13 alcohol could be used to open up the beta lactam shown and a palladium on carbon hydrogenation removed the bomb group at C7, as well as the benzyl group on the newly installed side chain, thus completing the two-phase synthesis of Taxol. In summary, the Baron group developed a route that allowed access to a range of cyclized intermediates, including the one shown, as well as taxodienone and taxodiene. The products of this cyclase phase could then be carried on in a number of different directions by deploying selective oxidation reactions to functionalize specific sites and reach increasingly complex targets. Ultimately, the range of taxing targets that this group has pursued in this research line lends a lot of credibility to this approach, and suggests that, more broadly, this is a very valuable approach to the divergent synthesis of complex targets. Thank you for watching this special Total Synthesis mini-lecture. If you enjoyed it, please support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions and comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time!